Hello, welcome back to the Introduction to Vaccine Epidemiology online course slash explainers. Just a series of videos, quick videos, telling you all about vaccines and what they do to populations and for populations. And that is what epidemiology is. It is the study of things that happen to the people. My name is Rene Najera and I'm the editor of History of Vaccines. You can visit our site at historyofvaccines.org. Part one and part two will be linked to below in the description. You can go there to look at the other introductions like the history of vaccines um, and also very basic concepts of microbiology, immunology, and toxicology. Again, just go down to the description and you can see in the description the links to these other parts. But today we're going to talk about herd immunity, correction community immunity. We're using community immunity more now because we're really talking more about people and not about herds. Herd is an antiquated term for this. Well, not too antiquated. Scientists still use it, but it's from the 1920s and it was when this effect was seen in mice and they called it herd immunity. And I'll explain the effect here in a, in a little bit. All right, so suppose that you have a group of people right here on the left and within this group of people there are a few people who are not immune to a disease for whatever reason. Either they didn't get the vaccine or they haven't had the, the disease itself that grants them immunity. They're just not immune. And now suppose that there is somebody coming into this population who has the disease. The question is, are these people going to be protected because of all these other people around them who are immune? And the answer, the quick answer is yes, that the, we have this significant level of people who are vaccinated or are immune because they contracted the disease and they're going to protect the ones in in the middle or the ones among them. This is very probabil probabilistic? probabilistic because it depends on the probability of this person who is ill coming into contact with the persons who are not ill and not immune. For example, if this person comes into contact with one, one of them right off the bat, they're probably going to infect them, right? But if they come into contact with a whole bunch of people for the time that they are infectious, by the time that they get to the, the non-immune people, they might not be infectious anymore. The disease will have passed. And so this assumes that the population is well distributed, meaning that these people are not concentrated and in close contact with the sick person right off the bat. It depends on the probability of this sick person coming into contact with the non-immune people versus the immune people. And when we talk about these things, we try to get into the just the raw numbers. What level of immunity is necessary for this effect to be observed? And the answer of that is to look at the basic reproductive number, which we looked at in part two. And again, you can go down to the description in the bottom for part two and look at the basic reproductive number. So the basic reproductive number, which we call R0, basically means how many people will this one person who is sick infect? And in the case of influenza, it's um, for the flu, it's, mm, it's, it's about two. You know, between two and three. But for measles, it is closer to 16. This one person with measles, if they if you put them in a room with 100 people who are not immune, it will infect 16 people. Those 16 people will infect another 16 people. And you can see how after a period of time, the epidemic of measles will go from one person to 16 to 16 times 16, which is 16 squared. And it'll just explode right away if no countermeasures are taken. And so if we want to kick in herd immunity, we use this formula. Herd immunity equals 1 minus 1 over the basic reproductive number. So let's do some math. For influenza, let's say that it's 3. So herd immunity kicks in at 1 minus 1 over 1 divided by 3. So it kicks in at around 66%. So 66% of the population needs to be immune for herd immunity to kick in against influenza. That means that we can vaccinate or if the people become sick at 66%, then the chances of an outbreak, another outbreak, or an outbreak in itself, um, if you don't, if you haven't had outbreaks because of good vaccination levels, are very low. Measles, on the other hand, is one minus one over 16, and so right off the bat, based on the denominators, you can see that 16 is much smaller than three. Uh, I'm sorry, much bigger than three, and because of that, the fraction itself is smaller. So it comes out to be around 93% or so. So that means that you need because it is so infectious, because of the R not being so high, you need about 93% of the population to be immune, immunized, uh, vaccinated against measles to prevent outbreaks. And I keep saying prevent outbreaks because that's what that's what uh, this is all about. It is not about preventing individual cases, though individual people do benefit from this. If you have somebody in a population who, for example, has um, some sort of advanced cancer that prevents them from from 
building up a good immune response against measles. If you put them in a highly vaccinated population, then the probability, again, going back to probabilities, of them coming into contact with somebody with measles is very low, right? Because almost everybody is immune. But if you put them in a population of, let's say, anti-vaccine people in Washington right now or in Brooklyn, their probability of coming into contact with somebody with measles is higher. And so they're at an individual level, their probability is high of, of getting sick and suffering the consequences. So one case or two cases in some cases is not an outbreak. Um, diseases like measles, you need several cases to be counted as an outbreak. Diseases like smallpox only takes one case and that, that is considered an outbreak. Her herd immunity or community immunity has an effect on outbreaks more than anything. When you see community immunity kick in, you see outbreaks die out. And when you see outbreaks die out, you see individual cases fall to very low levels. And when that happens, the disease is kept at bay. And in cases like smallpox, could be completely eradicated from the face of the earth. And polio, we're almost there. There's just a couple of more countries to go before it completely gets eradicated. Measles was declared eliminated, but because vaccination rates have dropped below the 93% in many communities, then uh, community immunity is not there and the outbreaks have returned. And of course, I'm talking about this level 93% among the population of interest. So if, for example, we have the entire United States, right? We're not saying that all of the United States needs to be 93% vaccinated or immune against measles. We're talking within a certain community, within a certain school, or even within a certain classroom where this needs to be the case. Because most adults will have had measles or the vaccination, so they're not at risk of contracting measles. We're talking about the high risk populations of children, thousands of children being born every year. If they don't get vaccinated, that means thousands of them who are not vaccinated, not immune, herd immunity collapses. So again, two, two important terms, community immunity, but it's a, at a community level or a subset of the community or a population of interest. The other thing we need to keep in mind is the R0 of the specific disease. And notice how it affects the formula that if the R0 is higher, then the proportion that needs to be achieved for community immunity is higher. And then finally, probabilities. We're dealing with probabilities here of an individual or a group of individuals within the community coming into contact with the, the people who are not immune. And of course, there are other assumptions. Um, so the assumption is, is looking at the population. Um, is it a population who is older, younger, and not immune? Are they people who are clumped together? Are there children who are clumped together? And the vaccine effectiveness. How effective is the vaccine at preventing the disease? So in the case of measles, we need 93% immunization. For that, we need a vaccine that is very highly effective, which the MMR is. And so we're not worried there too much. For influenza, we need 66%. But the vaccine efficacy has been pretty low in recent years, and that's because of how the virus is made, how the virus uh, comes around, how the vaccine is made. And so um, we need to immunize way beyond 66% of the population to achieve the 66% immunity. And the other thing is that this assumes a steady state population, a population that doesn't change. A classroom, for example, of children who are all always there, and if 93% of them are vaccinated against measles, then that's good community immunity within the classroom. But if, for example, children come and go from this from this classroom for some reason you know they they graduate they go on to another class um, they get put in detention or whatever if you have that happening then the uh, risk to community immunity is um, is there that you'll have somebody who is not immune coming in or somebody who is sick coming in well by definition if they're sick they're not immune they're going to cause an outbreak so it assumes a steady state of the population it assumes a good vaccine effectiveness rate it assumes that we have predefined our populations of what is a community you know is it is it the entire united states will know it's is it a city in some cases it may be in other cases it might not be you might have a city that doesn't have a lot of children in it and so measles is not really a concern as far as the community immunity aspect of it or you can have a, a neighborhood within a city where a lot of new parents with a lot of new children and so we need to get in there and vaccinate because there's a lot of susceptibles in there so those are the things that you need to keep in mind you need to keep in mind vaccine effectiveness what population you're talking about and the fact that populations are always in flux they're not steady and so you need to maintain that level for a long time all right so that concludes population community immunity <laughs> i keep wanting to call it herd immunity because that's what we call it for a very long time next time we're going to talk about vaccines and what evidence do we have that they work so section four yes indeed they work but again sections one and two are linked in the description to this video down in the bottom 
bottom left hand side you can go watch those that's a short introduction to history of vaccines and also very basic concepts in bacteriology virology and toxicology and some chemistry as well and then this one on herd immunity as always you can visit us at historyofvaccines.org for more information on the history of vaccines the science behind vaccines thank you for your time and have a great week